Good evening, everyone, and, and welcome to Adam Smith's Panmure House. I recognize a, uh, a few faces that have come to the entirety of our uh, lecture series, which is great, but also see some new faces, so that's also good. It's a beautiful evening here in Edinburgh. The sun is out, and we are taking part in, I believe, the world's largest arts festival, if you consider the Fringe and the Book Festival and the actual Edinburgh International <laughs> Festival. It's a, a real sight to see. And you have so much choice, right? You could be at a, at a theater or a dance performance this evening or a book reading, but you've chosen to come to the last home of Adam Smith, one of the greatest philosophers and economists of the modern era and someone we are grateful to have a piece of his, his, his life here in the 21st century. So I welcome you here to Penmere House. But Penmere House is not a museum. It is a living and breathing place that we want to make a place of reference of critical and honest social and economic debate on the issues that face us today. Many of the questions that, and issues that Smith and his contemporaries, who debated in this very room, Adam Smith held dinners here with other luminaries of the Scottish Enlightenment. And those same questions are questions that they debated then. What kind of society do we want to live in? What kind of economy do we want to have? What do we owe each other? What is morality? And these are the very questions that we at Panmare House are interested in taking forward in the 21st century. As such, Panmare House programs are designed to engage us with big issues and to promote nuanced, respectful debate at a time, unfortunately, when it is much needed. Tonight, we have Professor Estrella Trincado, who comes to us from the Complutense University of Madrid in Spain. She has a PhD in economics with a degree in both economics and philosophy. So like Adam Smith, she is broad-based and she focuses on history. She's the vice president, uh, vice president of the European Society for the History of Economic Thought. And she has received many accolades from economic historians. She's also the editor of the Iberian Journal of the History of Economic Thought and advisor for the Spanish, Spanish Association of Economic History. Please welcome to talk about Adam Smith and David Hume. Some of you may have seen the play, Estrella Trincado. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here uh, uh, talking about Adam Smith and David Hume, which are uh, well, I, I really celebrate the birth of Adam Smith. Uh, actually, I, I feel as if I were invited by Adam Smith himself to this house uh, where, uh, where he lived in the last uh, years of his, uh, of, of his uh, career and, and of his life. No? Uh, and so uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, about the relationship uh, between Adam Smith and David Hume, but more than uh, trying to uh, uh, talk about their similarities, I will talk about their differences, because I think that actually they were very different in the way in which they opposed their, uh, philosoph their philosophy. Their philosophies are really different philosophies, no? Uh, and uh, Adam Smith, uh, I... Uh, I think about uh, what would have happened if uh, really Adam Smith had written about philosophy because uh, although we had uh, the essays on philosophical subjects which he uh, actually um, well uh, not uh, published uh, in uh, where he, when he was uh, living but after death no uh, and, but he sp uh, uh, spurred from bur from burning of uh, uh, from fire uh, however, he did not, as such, uh, wrote 
for publication philosophy and uh, this is what I'm going to try to show that actually it is a different philosophy from, from that of David Hume. Hmm? Uh, they were very best friends uh, and, and they uh, knew each other probably from uh, 1748 uh, up to 1751 or 52. Uh, we do not know exactly when it was that they uh, went uh, to get to together but they were very best friends uh, and uh, actually uh, it, the, the acquaintance uh, was very near, they had a clear connection uh, between them. Uh, Adam Smith uh, was uh, 12 years younger than uh, David Hume uh, and they were quite different uh, obviously in their personalities because uh, Adam Smith is, is said to be uh, more uh, absent-minded, let us say, and David Hume more open, uh, uh, but however uh, Adam Smith was also open uh, to debates uh, and actually here uh, in this house uh, he uh, did most of his debates. No? Uh, the, the, one of the reasons uh, for uh, being uh, so close together uh, was in the fact that Scottish Enlightenment, the period of the Scottish Enlightenment uh, was a very a good period uh, for people uh, to to talk, to make debits, to in the literary societies where actually they met, uh, to get uh, to to know each other, uh, and uh, actually when uh, Smith advised him against settling in Paris, as as I've. Uh, put there uh, because it was uh, too many people there, no? and uh, in, in Scotland it's, it was more easy to get to know each other. No? And uh, he says a man is always displaced in a foreign country, but they, the French, live in such large societies, uh, and their affections are dissipated among so great a variety of objects that they can. Uh, bestow but a very small share of them upon any individual no? and uh, this, uh, this idea of, short, uh, of uh, not so uh, uh, large societies in which uh, uh, people can know each other and have connection is something quite important uh, for Adam Smith. No? Uh, actually, it, in, in France, it was in the culture of popularity. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau uh, was in, the, in this type of culture in which uh, more than connection, it was uh, image, the, one, the thing that was important. No? Uh, this special fr uh, fr uh, friendship uh, was um, precluded in some sense by the views of him uh, on religion, as, as you absolutely uh, know. No? Uh, and, and these views on religion prevented him from holding an academic office and the Church of Co Scotland attempted to excommunicate him twice. Uh, actually, it is not very clear if, uh, the, if Adam Smith was religious or not, uh, although it is obvious that for him it was not easy to talk about these questions. Uh, but however, in, in his lectures, uh, it seems that uh, he, uh, he tried not to, to say the, the typical prayer that was typical before the lecture. Uh, and uh, he, uh, but however, he finally had to do so, uh, to say the prayer. Uh, but he probably did it in a natural religion view. Uh, so instead of giving the typical prayer of, in, uh, which was typical in lectures in Scotland. Uh, and uh, however, uh, in, in a letter to William Strahan, uh, Smith says that Hume was, uh, the close, uh, um, came close to the idea of, as nearly to, uh, to the idea of a perfectly wise and virtuous man as perhaps the nature of human frailty will permit. Uh, this, uh, words were uh, for Adam Smith, uh, as, as you may know, uh, in, were, in many people criticized him uh, for having said this, uh, although Adam Smith, well, uh, Adam Smith knew the treatise of Hume uh, from Balliol College period in which uh, he read the, the treatise. The treatise, and in this, in this period, actually, it was the moment in which he did some of the philosophical uh, essays that he wrote. No, so in, uh, he was probably or criticizing or following David Hume in these philosophical questions, uh, and. Uh, so, so this criticism uh, made him say this note, which is so typical of Adam Smith, a single and, as I thought, a very harmless sheet of paper in which uh, when uh, David Hume uh, died, uh, Adam Smith defended uh, his friend. Uh, and 
so in this sheet of paper which I happen to write concerning the death of our late friend Mr. Hume brought upon me ten times more abuse than the very violent attack I, ha I had made upon the whole commercial system of Great Britain. Obviously the question of on religion uh, was the m most important uh, issue in, uh, or the most difficult issue to talk about. No? Uh, if, uh, well I would say that if I, I am uh, I admire both Adam Smith and David Hume. It is because they uh, have enough self-command to talk about things that uh, were very difficult to talk about, let us say, and in a different way as, as other people thought, and or most of the people thought, let us say, in in his in their period. No? Uh, um, however, uh, although Adam Smith and David Hume were very good friends, uh, they. Uh, they had different thoughts, no? Probably they had debated a lot on many things, no? And so uh, Hume, uh, Hume reproaches Smith in a letter, Robertson book, History of Scotland, has great merit, but it is evident that he benefits from your animosity against me, although I suppose the same thing happens in your case. So why should uh, Hume say this? Uh, why is it that Adam Smith is benefiting from the animosity with David Hume, and this is what I'm, go I'm going to try to show you. In uh, uh, talking about uh, first philosophy and ethics, because uh, Adam Smith had a, a whole idea of society, let us say, a, a, a system, uh, although n not a systematic system, because he was against uh, syst uh, people uh, of syst uh, the man of system, no? as I am going to talk about. However, uh, the, so the, there are different philosophies. So first, I am going to talk about the philosophies of David Hume, the, the phil uh, which, uh, as uh, you know, uh, he thought uh, in in the treatise and uh, in his investigations also, he talks about uh, how do we perceive objects. And he says that we perceive objects uh, from impressions that come uh, uh, to us and with these impressions we create by synthesis ideas uh, and with these ideas passions. No? So it is a synthesis from images that come to us. No? Uh, let us say uh, we feel uh, cold and, uh, and uh, 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 we feel cold and this and we create the idea of cold and then with this maybe a uh, hatred uh, will be the passion that will be created uh, through these images that uh, come to us. However, as you know, uh, there is no, he does not manage to see uh, the self, the idea of the self that actually records this uh, ideas uh, and he says that it's not, uh, the mind is nothing but a bundle or collection of different perceptions which exceed each other with an inconceivable rapidity and are in perpetual flux and movement. Uh, this is uh, such a typical sentence of him in which he, sa uh, he does not manage to see any self within this a flux of uh, of images. Hmm? So actually, uh, uh, the the man what he does is uh, with these images he records. Uh, it is habit. With by habit he will create uh, an uh, an ideas and passions. Hmm? And uh, the future also utility is also an image. What is the difference with Adam Smith? And Adam Smith uh, tries to. Uh, mm, uh, give a different way of showing how do we perceive things. And he says that in the first formation of language, the, the structure I am derives from existence I itself and expresses an internal feeling related to surprise and gratitude. Uh, for whatever is the cause of pleasure, natural ex excites our gratitude. This point of gratitude is something which in David Hume is not uh, he, uh, he does not talk very much about gratitude. He, in history of astronomy, he says uh, actually, according Hackinson, which is a very important uh, the, uh, 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 historian of economics, that uh, a specialist in Adam Smith, uh, Smith, uh, Smith was based on Samuel von Cauthy, that uh, in, in that he thought that the individual must under, understand life as a gift. Uh, so, uh, the first point I will make is that according to Adam Smith, instead of by images, there is a present and, uh, the, and this present and the memory of the I am, as I am going to show now in some sentences, 
uh, are observable from outside the time sequence, as uh, as we will see. No, uh, and here I some, have some quotes in which I uh, I will, will try to show that he had a different perception or of or, or view of how do we perceive. Uh, the man, uh, when he lies, uh, lays his hand upon his foot, as his hand feels the pressure of, or resistance of his foot, so his foot feels that of his hand. They are both external to one another, but they are neither of them altogether so external to him. He feels in both and he naturally considers them a part of himself, or at least as something which belongs to him and which for his own comfort it's necessary that he should take some care of. Uh, with in external senses, actually, it was then after uh, the treatise, so actually he's criticizing, uh, probably in the, the view of David Hume, uh, saying that actually we have, uh, we have a, 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 a real self and externality exists. So he was a realist uh, and he says, does any of our senses prior to observation and experience uh, instinctively the idea of instinct uh, so uh, is important. So something that instinctively makes us perceive per, uh, external uh, external solidity and substance, which excite the respective sensations. No, uh, so uh, um, uh, and so uh, first we will then, uh, denounce uh, this and other questions in considerations on the first formation of languages. Adam Smith also talks about this idea of uh, uh, the nouns are the first things, the first words that we create uh, and uh, then we tend to create other words and it is due to an unknown instinct principle uh, that we can read reality uh, in, so it is, uh, as I've said, realism. Hmm? Uh, one of the points also that I, I find uh, quite interesting is that he talks about the perception of depth. Uh, as, as for David Hume, uh, actually there is no, not, such a, not a, such a sensation of depth or perception of depth. We only see an image uh, in which uh, we only have uh, length and breadth, so it's not, uh, uh, we don't have depth. Hmm? But in the case of Adam Smith, he says the tangible world, world as well as all the different parts which compose it has three dimensions, length, breadth and depth. The, the visible world, uh, world as well as all the different parts which compose it has only two length and breadth. It presents to us only a plain surface which by certain shades and combinations of color suggests and represents to us in the same manner as a picture does. So this is the first time also that he says, well, there is depth and there is a, a, a perception is not image, but it is something intuitive that we that emerges in some sense in the present. And this idea is what I'm going to stress. The idea of the present in Adam Smith, as uh, in David Hume, it, there is no present. In Adam Smith, there is present. And actually, uh, it, for David Hume, habit and so the past is what makes us uh, stick to the past and be, he was more, much more conservative than, uh, than Adam Smith. No? Uh, he talks about, uh, well, the sense of perspective. We need to, time to regain it if we have lost it. In the, he puts the example uh, of the blind man Saunderson, which has, who had uh, uh, superpowers uh, of perception. No? Uh, and uh, when he began to see, uh, he slowly begins to understand the strong and distinctive perspective of nature. The weak and lackluster perspective of painting fails to impress him at all. So reality is about that and about this view of perception. And uh, he says, uh, well, it is not due to utility, but actually to the uh, perception of reality. No? And, the, and the greater ability to perceive objects uh, is not good because it's useful, but because it is correct, exact, and according to truth or reality. Uh, as for the human action, so this is uh, philosophy. We see that there is a great difference between Adam Smith and David Hume. Uh, but human action 
uh, also is different according to them. Hume so, uh, thought that the first move movement that we do when we are born uh, is, uh, is due to pleasure and pain, let us say. No? Uh, attraction towards pleasure, flight from pain, because we have to dread of uh, death. Uh, and when we remember that, it's uh, the memory of the dread of death makes us uh, go forward and try to avoid death. No? Uh, and, uh, well, reason or man, uh, according to him, as uh, in, uh, he is always trying to avoid death, uh, he is slave to his passions, no? or at least uh, uh, reason is slave uh, of his passion. And they, he puts this example, you may know, of, uh, of the man uh, that uh, puts the man to a fire the, and uh, when he's burned he will not uh, go to the fire more because he has been burned, there is pain and so uh, this is the way in which uh, experience let us make uh, well, uh, knowledge. No? The case of Adam Smith is different hmm? because uh, according to him the first movement is not based on on past experiences. This is something, well, it is not logical to think that past experience makes us move firstly because we do not have any past. Uh, and uh, so he relates it to curiosity and he says that desire of changing our situation necessarily supposes some idea of externality or motion into a place different from that in which we actually are. And even the desire of remaining in the same place supposes some idea of at least the possibility of changing. Those sensation could not well have answered the intention of nature had they not thus instinctively suggested some vague notion of external existence. So obviously he's uh, talking about uh, not uh, so, so curiosity towards reality, it is not a uh, uh, dread uh, or fear what makes us first move. The dread of death actually is the great poison, as he says in the theory of moral sentiments, the great poison to, to the human happiness. Uh, and, uh, and people, uh, he talks about soldiers, no? Soldiers that uh, do not have dread uh, of, uh, of death because uh, well, they have um, uh, faced it so much. And they have character of joy, light, lightness and lively freedom, so actually they are m much more happy, let us say, uh, due to not having dread of death. Uh, actually, Adam Smith, in Theory of Moral Sentiments, in the last uh, editions in special, he talks about se self-command. Self-command is for him the most important uh, virtue that we have, uh, talking about, in some sense, positive freedom more than negative freedom. Uh, so actually, we, uh, if we do not have self-command, then uh, there will not be behind us uh, the, the sentiments uh, the, that we uh, will have we, if we have self-command. Actually, he was against Stoicism and Epicureanism. He thought that Stoicism is passive. He, in the, the idea of a God in which uh, well, uh, we do not have passions at all, ataraxia is not what he is defending, uh, or his, uh, he, this is not self-command for him because it is uh, the, all the passions uh, on, the, on within uh, are in flowing from self-command, uh, and it's not Epicurean neither because uh, Epicureans, he said, he said uh, uh, are reactive uh, to, uh, to pleasure or pain, and they are always uh, thinking about reactivity. Uh, so self-command is, the, is um, the flowing of sentiments within. No? As, as for sympathy, uh, sympathy is also different in both of them. Uh, uh, according to Hume, we sympathize, uh, obviously, uh, Hume and Adam Smith, the sympathy is very important. The, the, we put ourselves in the place of other people and we think what we will feel if we were these other people. No? Uh, but according uh, to David Hume, uh, we sympathize with the motives uh, and with the consequences of uh, acting in relation to the self. No? For instance, I put myself in other person, in the place of other person, and I Im Im imagine if he's feeling pleasure or pain, and I will try to avoid this pleasure or pain. Hmm? And for instance, he says, the punishment of an adversary is good because it gratifies revenge. The sickness of a companion is evil because it affects friendship, always related to, our, to the self, which he actually did not uh, manage to 
uh, uh, to know why it exists or if it exists. Uh, he is going in some sense back to classics. Uh, uh, um, uh, Ores uh, says that, the same idea. The as human countenance smiles on those that smile, so does it sympathize with those that weep. So we, there is an emotional contagion. Uh, uh, actually, it is uh, this that it is not uh, easy uh, to, to avoid this contagion. And so we sympathize and we tend to be left by other people. No? Uh, and uh, one thing that he says that he, we sympathize with pleasure, but we flee from sympathizing with pain. This is something that Adam Smith was against. No, uh, obviously, according to this idea, we sympathize, we feel the pleasure of other people. Uh, if he, they are feeling pain, then we do not tend to sympathize with them because it's painful. Uh, and Adam Smith tried to show that this is not true. Hmm? Uh, and the way in which he shows uh, is first, uh, he says that the sense of merit depends on the direct sympathy with the motives of the agent, which is property, actually. He said, uh, uh, according to Adam Smith, property is the basic, uh, the basic virtue. No? Uh, so the direct sympathy with the motives, both of them say, if I, uh, the motive is very important, but an indirect sympathy with the gratitude of those who receive the benefit of their actions. So it is not so much uh, the pleasure felt by other people, but the gratitude of the people that are being benefited. So actually it is, uh, for instance, if I give a present to somebody, the motive is important, why I give that present, but also in the case of Hume, it is the pleasure the other, pe and the other person feels, uh, so it is something different from me. But in the case of Adam Smith, gratitude or, from that person to me is what uh, I actually sympathize with. So it is the connection. It is the connection, as I <laughs> show there, uh, between different people is what makes me uh, uh, feel merit of actions. Hmm? And, well, property, uh, he talks about the impartial spectator. Sympathy creates an impartial spectator of myself that actually uh, makes me uh, approve my own, act, my own actions. Uh, um, and, but he, this impartial spectator can have moral judgment against all humanity. Uh, in, in such cases, this demigod within the breast appears like the demigods of poets, though partly of immortal, yet partly too of mortal extraction. Uh, so it, uh, this idea of uh, a self outside time, immortal, is quite important also in Adam Smith. Uh, and it's given beyond times. And so we, uh, it is uh, not that we sympathize uh, with pleasure and pain, uh, because we want to share, uh, we want to feel pleasure and pain, but just because we want to feel with other people. We, it is a connection, what we, what we need, and this feeling with other people is what makes us sympathize. Hmm? Uh, utility is something that uh, David Hume was not utilitarian, I would say, but uh, he defended that we uh, search for, ut for utility. Hmm? And uh, however, against Hobbes and Mandeville, uh, which were amoral, let us say, uh, he, this does not imply egoism, so that we are not necess necessarily selfish. Uh, and benevolence is not hypocrisy, and friendship is possible, a public spirit is possible. Uh, however, we tend uh, to create, uh, 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 to be led by utility because um, people cannot live uh, alone. Uh, so natural and social virtues um, are, uh, are based on this utility which uh, glow, uh, make people uh, be um, uh, close together just uh, to, to try to, um, to be able uh, to, to live, no? uh, to survive, let us say. Uh, Adam Smith has, says that utility is love for system. He, is, he criticizes a lot in the theory of moral sentiments, uh, the utilitarian theory and the search for utility. He thought that utility gives us uh, some fictitious temporary hope, but not pleasure. Uh, for uh, we value the anxiety that beauty of the utility is exact, uh, uh, but however we do not 
a search for utility. And he, we have this quote of the poor man's uh, son uh, that you might know. Uh, he says uh, uh, the, the poor man's son uh, tried to search for uh, um, well, uh, wealth and, uh, and uh, greatness. Uh, and uh, when uh, he comes uh, and to, to his, the moment of his death, uh, his, uh, he begins at last to find that wealth and greatness are mere trinkets of frivolous utility, no more adapted for procuring his or body or tranquility of mind than the chooser case of the lover choice. So actually he has been all his life trying to obtain wealth uh, and, uh, and uh, even uh, doing things that were amoral. And uh, in the last analysis, he goes back and he uh, becomes aware. Be the idea of awareness is quite important. Becomes aware that it was not so important. No? Uh, so time is very important, uh, and the understanding of time, the great of universal confronter, uh, 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 in which he talks about this, or he repeats this sentence quite a lot in the theory of moral sentiments. Uh, can self-control uh, master passion, enjoying in advance the degree of tranquility that we anticipate that time will restore. Hmm? So it is present the, in some sense, and it is what we must search, not so much utility. And the, both of them talk about the arts and tragedy. And uh, uh, according to David Hume, the standard, uh, he talks about the standard of taste, uh, uh, an essay of him, which is subjective according to him. He comes back uh, to Roman period, actually to classical. And uh, actually, Adam Smith is given some different view of philosophy from classical also. No? So the, he's detaching from, uh, from a classical uh, idea of philosophy and tragedy. Uh, and, uh, but however, according to David Hume, there is an, a universal standard, he says, that is achieved through experience of wind and wisdom. So uh, we tend to experience more and more and we get to know the idea of taste or uh, the standard of taste. Uh, according to David Hume, beauty uh, of language comes from ornament, uh, uh, produces surprise and appearance of difficulty, and this is the idea of image. I, I'm trying to relate all the things because this an image which is ornamental, and so we are so surprised about it. Uh, and in the case of imitative arts, he says, beauty depends on similarity with the imitated object. For instance, in a picture, uh, in a sculpture, uh, then uh, it is a similarity with nature uh, that we have imitated, no? because we admire the way and the, the hand that has created it. No? Actually, it is uh, the uh, admiral of the, the hand that has created and the pride, or, uh, 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 we are proud about that. No? Uh, so it is always image. Hmm? Uh, not only when we look at it, we admire not only beauty of the means uh, related to the ends, but beauty of the mind. Hmm? And the, sa uh, the same happens with, with plays. When we watch a play, according to Helen Smith, uh, we like to convey feelings of rage, of pity, the, uh, because the mind if, is uncomfortable at rest and, and uh, it needs distraction. So it is an image that distracts us and makes us uh, feel uh, well, that the time passes. No? In the case of Adam Smith, he, he criticizes also so this. Uh, he says that beauty of language does not depend on the ornamentation, but on simplicity and, trust, and trustfulness. No? He says that, well, the meaning is pre-linguistic, it is said. Uh, it is the idea of intention of the author. So uh, actually, uh, we uh, want to know what other people, know, uh, the same as in sympathy, what other people think, not so much uh, an ornamental uh, point. No? Uh, and uh, in imitative arts, he also uh, has a different view than David Hume. Beauty depends on disparity instead of uh, the other way around in the case of David Hume, imitation. And the, the disparity makes us uh, think, uh, uh, well, feel surprised because we have not observed that in nature. Uh, and so, uh, in, in some sense, what we want to see is the original feeling of the author. So, uh, it is surprising, be, uh, it is a non-naturalistic art, and we want, once more, to be connected to the author, to another person, not so much to an image in itself. No? 
Uh, for instance, I have put that uh, sentence, every good statue and picture is a fresh wonder which at the same time carries in some measure its own explication along with it. So it's, uh, it's something new. Hmm? Uh, and in the case of a tragedy, the admiration of a plane comes less from the pleasure it gives than from the fact that actors manage to maintain the center of attention. So the idea of expert, exp, uh, the spectator, which is very important in Adam Smith, uh, and, uh, and the pleasure of co-feeling with, of feeling with other people uh, and with the, uh, the author, hmm? the arts. Hmm? Uh, then with justice, I'm trying to uh, make a brief because I don't have much time then. Uh, justice and David Hume uh, um, has a, an idea of justice based on utility. Hmm? Justice is based on utility. He puts the example uh, of, of a boat in which uh, two people are rowing. Uh, and so they know that they need to, uh, with the oars, go uh, more and more rowing because they know that if not, they will uh, draw, the, uh, it will be a disaster for them. But they do not know very much why they, they need to do it, but they know that they need to do it. No? And this is in some sense institutional Darwinism. So uh, uh, we uh, know that we need to go further. No? Uh, and uh, according to him, um, well, Justice is punishment is, is based on, uh, on, on the imaginary end of public order. So uh, actually when we punish some, somebody for having committed an offense or a crime, uh, then we are assuming that uh, he will, uh, uh, there will be recidivism. So they, he will uh, do it once more, trying to avoid in the future uh, this, um, uh, this offense. No? Uh, and, um, I, we, I will see what's the difference with Adam Smith. No? Uh, for instance, in property, prop, uh, pri, uh, private property, for both of them is very important. But in the case of David Hume, uh, for when men uh, f uh, from their, their early education, education is uh, basic. So we educate people to uh, assume that property is good, for instance, uh, have become sensible of the infinite advantages that result from it and they must seek for a remedy by putting these goods as far as possible on the same footing with the fixed and constant advantages of the mind uh, and the body. This can be done after no other manner than by convention. A convention one, uh, is uh, as for luck, no? entered into by all the members of society to bestow stability of the possession of these external goods. A stability of possession is quite important. According to Ida Smith, however, in lectures on jurisprudence, he talks about this, and it's very interesting um, philosophy of justice. He says that justice is not, a, is not an image that we create to avoid recidivism, but it arises uh, naturally, for, it's a natural feeling when, uh, w uh, from the spectator of injustice. So, uh, for instance, in presence of, of uh, uh, an offense or a crime, then we feel indignation. And this is the basis of justice, indignation. This sentiment, which is the opposite to sympathy, it's indignation, we feel indignant when someone may, uh, does, does something which is unjust. Uh, this is not an adaptive, non-helpful feeling. Uh, actually, it is indignation and it implies uh, revenge in some cases. No? Uh, and so it is, uh, and so we uh, we do not have an uh, emotional contagion, be, uh, contagion, uh, because uh, we descend from what so some other people has done to someone who we love or we think that he does not deserve uh, that uh, uh, crime or that offense. No, and he says the revenge of the injured, which prompts him to retaliate the injury on the offender, is the real source of punishment of crimes. That which Grotius and other writers commonly allege as the original measure of punishments, with the consideration of public good, will not sufficiently account for the constitution of punishment. So, actually, it is more the revenge of the injured. Uh, what happens uh, in the first stages of society is that people, uh, uh, when they are in front of an injustice, they tend to revenge or there is a retaliation. And what they did at this period was uh, go to someone who, uh, uh, 
who were, was able to uh, to establish justice uh, and uh, an arbitrator, let us say, uh, and uh, give him a present actually, and uh, say uh, tell them, well, Solomon, no, uh, uh, pre please um, try to uh, to put justice into this, and uh, he will be the one. This is how do we uh, how we create the state according to him the state is naturally something uh, uh, peop, uh, some person arbitrator that is able to establish justice uh, and but however uh, previous to that there is the sentiment which is indignation so it's a natural uh, justice no that we have we delegate our indignation uh, and the point is that the state avoids uh, revenge uh, and uh, avoid the double revenge. So it's not only uh, that uh, uh, someone revenge that another will revenge against that person because he thinks it's not uh, just. And so there will be a circle of, um, of violence. Hmm? Uh, according to him, property is indignation also of the spectator of, uh, uh, of someone who usurps something which I'm uh, occupying or I'm maintaining. Uh, and so it is also indignation hmm? uh, to the first occupant. He thought that property is uh, actually the, the, the is based on occupation. Finally, economics uh, also there is a difference, and uh, the point is that uh, now eco in the, co the economics nowadays is based on more on David Hume than on Adam Smith actually. Uh, I, David Hume has had a mechanistic view of economy, special flow mechanism, you may know, uh, which uh, implies that the positive balance of trade is impossible because then uh, price will go up and then and there will be a, de a, a decrease in exports and increase in exports. Uh, and so uh, there will be a flow of especially outside, uh, abroad. No? Uh, and so well, the special flow mechanism is quite mechanistic. Actually, Adam Smith uh, did not introduce this concept in The Wolf of Nations. Hmm? Uh, uh, although he says that it, it is quite uh, well, uh, interesting, but uh, uh, he does not uh, talk much more about special flow mechanism. And uh, David Hume also talks about the tax incentive. This is something uh, he, uh, in, he, in his historical view of how uh, capitalism emerges, he says that taxes uh, actually uh, at first were something good because people tried to pay for taxes. Hmm? And so they worked more to pay for taxes. Uh, and this is the way in which capitalism began and there was, uh, a, uh, in some sense, uh, if it, they are mild taxes, not very high taxes, they could be good. No? Uh, so it is between liberalism and mercantilism and actually a special flow mechanism in the short run, it implies some type of um, positive um, uh, view of, of money. No? Mm -hmm. Uh, and well, according to whom exchange, uh, we exchange because we anticipate the utility. We are going to see that not for Adam Smith. Uh, and uh, he talks about entrepreneur, entrepreneurial activity. Uh, the active entrepreneur, he uh, says that uh, in economics, uh, people uh, are moved by action, by action, no? uh, uh, and also by imitation, which is quite important for him. Uh, but um, so the, uh, the entrepreneur is an active person, no? and um, however, there are different spirits of enterprise in different historical periods. No? Uh, and state debts, uh, fear of the decline of all, uh, so the state debts are, is something that both of them talk a lot about, but for David Hume, in his conservative view, he thought that civilization tend to collapse. Uh, due to debts, no? and so uh, it is coming back in some sense to the same point. He is uh, in in a, an idea of the, uh, a circle uh, of uh, of progress. No? Uh, Adam Smith. Uh, well, he talks about uh, the, there is the Adam, the Adam Smith problem that you may know, no? uh, which is uh, due to this sentence, it's not from the benevolence uh, of the butcher, the brewer and the baker that's we, that we expert our dinner, but in regard to their own interest. Th there has been a lot of uh, uh, literature on this. 
and, and people, Campbell and Ross, uh, say they, he was a contemplative utilitarian. He was, th there is a, really a problem, but uh, there are many people nowadays that say that there is no problem, no? Uh, and actually, I, I put here the quotes on, uh, on well, uh, one other uh, metaphor that he talks, the invisible hand metaphor, no? Uh, what he was talking actually is this idea of the present that I have been talking about, no? uh, and the invisible hand uh, a metaphor. Uh, you know that there were three times in which, just three times, uh, in which he uses this metaphor. The first is in the theory of moral sentiments. It is all about uh, um, ethics, actually. The first, the rich consume little more than the poor, and despite of in their selfishness, they divide with the poor the, in the produce of all the improvements. They are led by an invisible hand. The second, uh, in the wealth of nations, no, uh, every individual not neither intends to promote public interest, no knows how much is promoting it, but in the market, finally, uh, he intends only his own security. Uh, but finally he's led by an invisible hand to promote an end which is not part of his intention, once more. And the third one, which is interesting, because it's from the history of astronomy. He talks about the invisible hand of Jupiter, no? uh, and, and he talks about the polytheistic religions. Uh, according to David Hume, polytheistic religions were better than monotheistic uh, because they tend to create more stability, let us say. Uh, but uh, he was also against him in this point, uh, and he says that in polytheistic religions among savages as well as in the early ages, uh, it is ir uh, the ir irregular events of nature only that are ascribed to the agency and power of gods. Fire burns, water refreshes, heavy bodies descend, and lighter substances fly upwards by the necessity of their own nature, nor was the invisible hand of Jupiter ever apprehended to be employed in those matters. But if we, according to him, actually maybe the invisible hand of Jupiter should have been uh, uh, also in the, in the calm events, let us say, not in the very um, uh, well, um, important or uh, unequal events. No? So these are the first, the, the only three cases, no? Uh, so actually his economics is about uh, trying to avoid the man of system. Uh, the man of system, he, he's always tried, uh, mercantilism was a man of and people that uh, thought they were so uh, enamored by the, this image they had of uh, society. Uh, and that they didn't uh, know that uh, he seems to imagine that he can arrange the different members of a great society with as much ease as, as the hand arranges the different pieces upon a chessboard. He does not consider that the pieces upon the chessboard have no other principle of motion besides that which a hand impresses upon them. Uh, but uh, every single piece has a single uh, as a principle of motion of its own. We cannot. Uh, control everything. Hmm? So this is uh, actually what he does in The Wealth of Nations, where he uh, talks about uh, uh, wealth and natural propensity. Uh, also, uh, there is a propensity of human beings. It is not that we search for utility, but even exchange is na a natural propensity. Uh, uh, to barter, track, uh, and to exchange one thing for the other. And this depends on language, actually, because language is the basis for exchange. No? It is, uh, uh, I've, um, I think it's an economics of becoming aware of what actually is valuable, because labor commanded, uh, well, he talks about labor and the value of things depend, depend on labor commanded, which is the natural price. Uh, uh, the labor that we can command in other people and that we save and we do not have to do ourselves. No? And so when we exchange, it is not that we obtain some utility, but it is that we uh, avoid, so save the labor that we would have done if we needed to do everything, if it weren't for division of labor. No? 
so it is not a, a, not accumulation but growth. Uh, so in, in this they were also different, David Hume and Adam Smith. They talk about China. China in that period uh, there was riches uh, from the past. No? Uh, and David Hume uh, said that uh, they were quite wealthy. Uh, in the case of Adam Smith, he says that China was not wealthy because, uh, because actually in their, in they were not growing. What is important is growth, not, uh, not wealth. No? And the state must, uh, must not encourage, but allow wealth. No? He, sa uh, he says the progressive state is cheerful. He says, uh, uh, actually, it is cheerfulness what makes something uh, so that we know the future. No? And habits and prejudices are an obstacle to growth, not, not the way in which we grow. Uh, besides, um, uh, as against David Hume, taxes are not a way also uh, to, to um, grow more because there is no art which one government sooner learns another uh, than that of uh, draining money from the pockets of the people. Uh, so actually, uh, it is very easy to do that. Uh, and uh, finally, he, criti see, he criticizes the entrepreneur uh, he was uh, obviously in favor of the entrepreneur, which is the safer and uh, who creates things. No, uh, but uh, he talks about the projector who uh, uh, uses the capital that has been accumulated by other people, and finally we, uh, in, uh, with idea, uh, ideas that are not sound enough and he will make uh, society collapse. No? So only the uniform, constant and uninterrupted effort of every man to better his condition will be the way in which we can grow. No? Uh, so well, finally capital accumulation will be then uh, about growth, but uh, so if the demand for labor and the supply of labor uh, manage to grow more the demand for labor, so we uh, save more than uh, the supply of labor increases uh, through population increases, then we will have growth. Uh, we, I show here how uh, it managed to grow, uh, how can we manage to grow, and we will have the uh, growing path of, um, of the economy no? and the stationary state. Uh, classical economics talks about this stationary state. No? So finally, uh, trying to conclude, uh, too much time maybe I've taken, uh, Smith presents a new philosophy on the present intuition and death. Uh, human action is based on curiosity and self-command, not utility. Also, arts demand, depend on, on present communication of sentiments. Uh, and when trying to imitate nature on disparity, also on communication once more. Justice depends also on a present sentiment, indignation, uh, uh, which delegation leads to the creation of the state, and economics depends on a present feeling, the natural propensity to barter, not on utility. So it is the present, and uh, so uh, I, as I try to show, there is a very big difference between David Hume and Adam Smith, and it is in the present that Adam Smith thinks that things happen. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry for <laughs> sorry for your time. <laughs> I have not been able. Great, thank you so much. Um, I first have to apologize. I, I didn't introduce myself um, when in my excitement to introduce our speaker and, and our fringe event. I'm Professor Adam Dixon. I'm the Adam Smith Chair here at Penmere House. Um, so we'll get that out of the way. But in the, in the few minutes we have rema uh, remaining, uh, we do have some opportunity to ask uh, Estrella some questions. There will be a mic that's going around. Um, if you have a question, please uh, raise your hand. We have time for two, possibly three questions. I'd be happy to kick it off, but um, there's a question there, gentleman there, third row. Um, the, could you comment on possibly differences between the two on uh, the big corporations like the, uh, the India, East India Company, for example, as kind of major monopoly. And the other thing is, of course, is slavery and any effect of colonialization and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for the question. Uh, so, well, uh, the major differences, because Adam Smith uh, was uh, really 
uh, against the monopoly of, of East India companies and, and he thought that they were too costly uh, to, uh, uh, to England, no? uh, although he didn't want, uh, obviously, the independence, for instance, of America, he thought that uh, uh, that actually uh, it, uh, uh, they needed to have equal, uh, equal, um, uh, equal rights, no? equal rights uh, than, than British people. No? Uh, so uh, he, he, in that sense, was also uh, against in the uh, colonization and colonies. And this is something he talks a lot about, no? uh, whereas in the case of Hume, uh, he was not so much uh, uh, against monopoly as, as the case of Adam Smith, no? And in the case of slavery, he, well, he talks about, uh, there is the, this quote of David Hume uh, about Negroes and, uh, but, uh, uh, but however, uh, in the case of Adam Smith, he, wa he uh, talks about slavery, he was uh, very against slavery uh, and, uh, and uh, liberty in general. Uh, and this is uh, something that he uh, talks a lot also about. No, and the, the slave is not uh, is not a good uh, economic way in which we can actually uh, uh, create a society because because a slave only will uh, work for dread of of punishment and not uh, because of uh, uh, his own opportunities no and so this is something uh, slavery something that he uh, well he criticizes a lot uh, and he, he it was uh, something different from the way in which other people talk about slavery in that period uh, also it is in an economic but also in uh, also in uh, in a moral uh, term no that he talks about slavery and he says that it is slave work is not a good uh, option um, and so, well, in the, in the 19th century, actually, uh, there has been in economic history some people that have said that actually it was something uh, a much more um, um, uh, so uh, uh, people could obtain, uh, the, bo the bosses could obtain uh, more from slaves uh, than, than we can think. So it could have. Uh, uh, be, maintain itself this type of system, if it not it were not for uh, the the war uh, in the independence uh, or, or the uh, the um, the fact that people tried to avoid slavery. No, so, so it's this point. Uh, so this uh, are the differences. Yeah. Right, we'll take uh, one one question. One more question, gentlemen. Okay. We'll, we'll do two. Um, um, and if yeah, him and then. Uh, Thank you very much for the talk. That was very interesting. Uh, I must confess, uh, I'm still uh, trying to adjust to the ideas because I've always thought of uh, Hume and Smith as uh, related in a sense, you know, philosophically. And, uh, and I have always thought that, uh, in a sense, Hume takes the argument so far and then Smith carries it on. Uh, into more practical applications and the, the organization of society and government, etc., and taxes, etc. Uh, so that was how I always looked at it, and um, I am now having to uh, rethink some things. But I wonder if you would care to comment on the basic idea that both of them thought empathy was uh, the basis of morality, and that, uh, you know, human beings have to show. Uh, and feel concern for each other uh, as a, a basis for their moral actions. Um, and this would then follow through into an emphasis on education, which I think both of them shared, that uh, these feelings should be nurtured and um, developed uh, in young people so that you have a, a society where people care for each other. Uh, now, in a sense, that's still my old way of thinking about this. Uh, is there anything in that that you would want to uh, correct? Or uh, do you think empathy does really have uh, a major role to play in, in both their ways of thinking about these things? Mm -hmm. If you can give a quick answer so we can get the okay. second. Okay. So a very interesting question because uh, um, according to Adam Smith, actually empathy is something natural that even the most... Uh, mm, 
vicious person in the wo in the world can ha feel empathy or sympathy, he says, but uh, for another people. So it's something natural that emerges naturally, and it does not need education. Is uh, actually. Uh, he says that education and uh, education in the first stages of society needs to be, the, the state needs to be the one who uh, at least promote this education, uh, because if not in a, a civilized society, he says, a division of labor tends to make people, uh, stupefy people, because they are so uh, devoted to putting the pin and the, the head to the pin, and, and so the, actually, uh, in they are the deleterious effects of, uh, the, of uh, uh, the market, what, uh, what he thinks that education tries to avoid, no? so that people have a broad image of things and do not devote to something so specific as, as putting the pin. Uh, and so, uh, so actually, according to Adam Smith, education is not uh, such uh, uh, so important because actually he talks about the savage man. The savage man has a, a self command, and uh, he uh, saw that in the savage people, well, in the people from America, not uh, uh, that uh, uh, happened to show so self command, and uh, they uh, want his he says uh, with a song of, uh, of death when they were. were uh, they, they were um, offended, no? Uh, they uh, have self-command and uh, song, uh, sing this song of death, no? Uh, without thinking about uh, what it was happening, no? And he was really, uh, he thought that, that he, they were really uh, great people, no? Uh, those savage people, they didn't have education. So I, I'm not sure that uh, Adam Smith, although education was important for him, but it's more uh, to avoid the deleterious effects or the bad effects of market, of the market. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just if you make your question very, very quick and brief, please. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I can really, but... Um, <laughs> Try. Uh, I mean, it's it, it, difficult it, it, to... It, it, it's, it's very striking that Adam Smith couldn't leave the theory of modern of moral sensitivity alone, could he? He kept on revising it, and and he clearly ha had some sort of idea. He was trying to say something very radical indeed, and I wonder whether the thing he was trying to say was something to do with with the centrality of relationship in the human in the experience in the human's experience of himself. That is, you know, our whole identity is constructed in relationship. Whereas someone like Hume could imagine a completely separate human being having a theory about the world but standing aside from it. So Adam Smith had an idea of the, 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 the you know, the, we, could, we, can, we, can, we can sort of, we can imagine standing outside the world, but actually we can't stand outside the world at any point in our experience. And that was completely radical. It's so radical, I don't think he had a language for it back then. And we'd recognize it now as very much, a, you know, a, a kind of core psychological understanding of human construction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point because it is true that he uh, he uh, well um, tries to do uh, uh, until the last moment of his life uh, uh, new versions of the theory of moral sentiments, in including more self commands And self command is something that it's uh, outside, so it's something that includes other people, no? uh, and uh, it's not uh, the individual that sums up with other individuals and obtain our utility, but we need other people. It's a way in which we uh, understand ourselves even. Uh, and so uh, this is a very good point because I think that he uh, wanted to say something that he could not finally because of the philosophical basis that I would say that he should have gone backwards to, uh, to philosophy more than, uh, although obviously theory of moral sentiments was his most, uh, for him, the most important. A work that he had done, although the Wealth of Nations was much more celebrated in, in the period in in other countries, and but the theory of moral sentiments was for him his best book. No? Great. Well, let's give um, Professor Trincado another round of applause. Thank you very much.